So I'm glad you're all here because it, it's very hard to be the last speaker at a conference because everybody's always tired and people are left for home already. And so I'm the one keeping you from having a weekend and well, that might be a tough job. So I thought let's do it a bit lightweight talk. This is not a heavy talk. I won't show that much code actually. It could be that I won't show any code anyway. Um, and it's to talk about Agile. This is an XP conference, so um, there's a lot of stuff about Agile. And, uh, I've been doing Agile projects for about 15 years now, which is quite a long time. And um, I've seen that also Agile projects will fail. Although you might think, hey, I'm, we, we came out of this waterfall era and now we're moving into the Agile era and everything will be alright. It will not. Your Agile projects will fail as well. And I'll try to explain to you in the next 50, 55 minutes or so why that is. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And I'll show you some of the slides. Actually, uh, I did the same talk last week in Kharkiv um, at another conference. I don't know if anybody was there. I know some of you were there, actually. But, uh, um, so I changed it a tiny little bit, so it's a bit of the same. So OK, here we go. So this is me. Actually, this is a picture in Kharkiv last year. Um, I have a really difficult name, I guess, in Ukrainian. It's called Sander Hogendorn. Uh, no, it doesn't really matter, actually. So I work for a company called Capgemini, which is a very, very large company. I think we employ about 130,000 people in over 40 countries. Um, and we don't have an office here. I, I try to figure that out, but we didn't have one. So I have this stupid functionality called Principal Technology Officer. It actually doesn't mean anything. It's just like, it's sort of like an excuse to do all day of coding and stuff like that. So I'm a developer, basically. And I've written some books. Uh, about UML, two books about Agile, and some other stuff, and I do talks at conferences, whatever. The only thing that's really interesting on this slide is that this is my website, it has a lot of Agile stuff on it. And this is my Twitter account, so if you want to tweet about this thing or ask me questions, uh, tweeting is an easy way to do that. So, uh, a brief introduction of where I come from. This little blue area here, here is it's called the Netherlands. You might have heard of it. It's, uh, it's an interesting country. I'll show you some of the things that we're famous for, like uh, windmills. That's something we have in the Netherlands. This is actually along the highway in the Netherlands somewhere. Um, <laughs> I took this picture while driving 120 over the highway. And, uh, so. and uh, some other stuff. So this is Amsterdam. You know Amsterdam, of course. Uh, it has a lot of lights, including in different colors, like red. And, um, <laughs> and this is actually my favorite painting in the world. It's by Vincent van Gogh. It's in a museum in Amsterdam. And I actually visited the place that it was painted, and it still looks the same 100 years uh, later. Um, it's somewhere in France. So you all know these. These are tulips. They also come from the Netherlands. And we're also famous for other plants as well. Hey, I missed one. I had a slide with some marijuana plants on it, but it sort of like disappeared. And that's what they do in the Netherlands these days. It disappears, the marijuana. I don't know why. So, and we're also infamous for this one. This is the Dutch team. Actually, this is when we had better times. Like, this is just before the uh, World Championship Finals, which we lost also. And then we came here and we lost all three matches. And <laughs> anyway, this, this is because we didn't act as a team, actually, the Dutch team. They were all 11 individuals, all in their own roles, not working together. And that's a very good step up to talk about Agile, right? Oh, so here's my new book. It just came out, it's in Dutch, so you won't be able to read it. Um, but anyway, it's a good book, and the German version will be out in two weeks, and we're actually discussing translating that to Ukrainian. That sounds a lot of fun, I think. So the English translation will be done too. So, okay, here we go. Oh, I was in Kharkiv last week, did, doing a lecture at the university. I really don't understand what this is saying, by the way, but uh, it looked nice. And <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Oh yeah, I'm also a developer, right? I, usually I write code. People ask me, do you still write code? Yes, I do. I do that three to four days a week, and I love doing that. I've been writing code since I was 14. So I've been doing that for 31 years, and it's still the best job there is, writing code. It's what I do. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'm now doing a project which builds an, uh, an ASP.NET web application on top of one of the largest COBOL applications in the Netherlands. It's the social security system. And uh, um, they wanted to do some different stuff because new users, uh, they don't use the character-based screens anymore. They don't want to do that. So we're building a web application. In this web application, if you change something in a field of a form and you would browse away to, let's say, another page or you close a browser or whatever, they want to have this message box that pops up and say, hey, you have changes. Uh, um, 
So do you want to save them first or go away to another page? It's something the browser does for you. So I was uh, experimenting a bit with jQuery, um, and then my project manager, he phoned me up at one time and he said, you know what, we are in a demo for the CEO of the social security agency. And um, so I was working with some message boxes and still trying to figure it out how that works best. And then he sent me a screen uh, grab of a particular screen that popped up during the demo. <laughs> and he asked me, are there any more of these in the application? I said, well, I really don't know. It might be, but luckily there weren't any. So, here we go. Waterfall. Are you in Waterfall projects? Or are you all in Agile projects? Are you still in Waterfall? Oh, dear. Oh, oh, good for you. So the rest of you been, is in Agile projects? I'll tell you a bit about the history of Waterfall, though. Here's a white paper called Managing the Development of Large Software Systems. It's written by a guy called Winston Royce. He was sort of chief technology whatever at Lockheed. And um, he wrote this white paper a while ago. Do you know at what point in time he wrote this? What year? You weren't born back then. 60s. 60s. No, that's too early. It's actually 1970. So the original white paper that first got the wonderful message in it was written in 1970. And you might think, oh, that's a bad thing. It isn't, because this white paper is really, really good. And it has a famous picture in there. You know this picture, right? You've had it at university and stuff, and well. It, the picture isn't that bad, you know, because it displays all of the different disciplines that you need to build software. Like you need to think about requirements, do some analysis, do some design, build some stuff, test some stuff, and then yeah, you might put it into production. It doesn't happen a lot to waterfall projects, I know, but usually they stop right here or somewhere there and they, they fail and they start it all over again with a different name. They print new t-shirts and stuff like that. So, so what is so wrong about this model is that any of these stages, because they are called stages, ends in uh, delivering a milestone, which is usually a document. And along the way, they get thicker and thicker and thicker until you start coding somewhere two years down the road in the project, right? That's where we come in. They say, well, could you come and help out on the coding of this particular project? I'll, I'll tell you a story about the project I was in uh, a while ago, about, I don't know, 15 years ago. And they said, could you come and coach the development part of this project? And it had been running for like a year and a half. And they produced, um, sorry, 700 pages of documentation. And it was my first project I did for an international bank. And I didn't know anything about banking. I still don't, by the way, but... Um, <laughs> and I said, well, <coughs> it's all in here. Read the document and you will know. <laughs> well, I'm a developer. I don't read documents, you know. That's, that, uh, <laughs> I only write stuff. And, and <coughs> so I went through the document and I didn't understand it, right? So I thought, you know what, I'm going back to these guys that did the design. And as it happens in waterfall projects, people are actually asked to leave the project when their milestone is delivered. So project, has anybody viewed project manager, by the way? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <coughs> so usually project managers look at this picture and they say, you know what, this is an MS project sheet. Or it's a Gantt chart or whatever you might call it. So at the end of design, the designers leave the project because you don't need them anymore, right? There's this documentation and you can do it from there. So, you know what, I thought, let's visit the designers and see what they're up to and ask them what's in the document, because I didn't understand it. One of them was working on another project for the same bank, but this bank, this particular bank owns about half of Amsterdam, so he was in a different building. And it was very hard to get touch of her. And the other one, she left the company. She now was working for a competitor. So I couldn't ask her anything. And there I was. So I went to the end users. They were actually there, end users. That was pretty hard times to find the end users because they were in the main offices in the, of this bank in the safe. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a really, really big door, something like, something like this. And to go into the safe, I had to hand off everything I had, my passport and stuff like that, and then I could go in, ask them questions, go out to the other building where we were programming, and start programming again. That didn't work, right? So another bad thing is that uh, um, not only do you lose all the knowledge uh, uh, in every stage of this project, because <coughs> although you, you might write really uh, 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 thick documents, still much more of the knowledge is in the head of the designers and the analysts and the requirements people anyway. So <coughs> that leaves your project. A lot of the knowledge leaves the project. So that's not good. And another bad part about this is when testing starts. Testing starts when development is done. 
right? That's what they do. So we as developers deliver the code, we, we go on for about half a year, and have a beer, deliver the code, we're happy, we're done with it, and then the testing starts. So I'll tell you another story about a project at another bank. They have this desktop application. I have to take a sip of water though because my throat is really dry. It's due to, to add tension to the, the speech as well. You know. <coughs> so uh, um, there, there we were, we were done coding, and this particular desktop application, it had the end the idea that every time you go from one field to the next field, um, they trigger all these validations, and they were triggered dynamically, so a lot of objects got created and stuff like that, and it was okay, it looked like the nice architecture. But we as developers, we had powerful PCs back then. They had an 8386 processor in it. Yeah, you're too young for that, I guess. It's, uh, <laughs> it was a really powerful processor back then. And then it went over to the testers, and they had the same PCs as the end users had. And it had an 8086 processor in it, which was about three times slower than the ones we had. So every time we moved from one field to the next field, it took them three seconds. This was a data entry application. So they said, well, yeah. on the first day they started testing, they said, this can never work. Go back. And we went back, and it took us half a year to rebuild the architecture, and rebuild all the software, and then it went down again. So waterfall, actually, it doesn't work, right? That's the basic conclusion you have to draw. Um, but this particular white paper, you might say, this is a horrible white paper. And it isn't, because it's actually one of the best white papers ever written in this field. And I'll show you why. Because the next picture in the same white paper is this one, written in 1970, mind you. So he says, actually, Winston Royce, at any stage in your project, you should be able to go back to previous stages and adjust all the stuff. Adjust your design, adjust your analysis, and even adjust your requirements, and then go forth again. So this was actually pretty good stuff. And there's an interesting quote in the white paper too. It says, note that it is simply the entire process, like all the activities here, done in the miniature, right, to a time scale that is relatively small with respect to the overall effort. He actually says, you can do any of these activities, but do them in a small period of time. And well, if you do it in a small period of time, you only can take one or two or three work items. Actually, instead of being called the father of waterfall, he should be the grandfather of Agile. Because that is what we do in Agile projects. We do all these activities, but we do them with very small units of work in very short, short periods of time, called iterations, of course. So you might think this is actually a very good white paper. So, then the next step is, Agile works always. If I do an Agile project, it will succeed. There is a large group of people out there, project managers, uh, customers, people like that, who actually think that this, is, that this is the case. And I'll show you that it's not. Agile is not a silver bullet. Your Agile projects can fail too, right? Um, so, I was tweeting a bit, I do that all the time, and I tweeted this. Just witnessed the 10 million euro classical waterfall software development project Phil Bizzaboo. What's your ideas about that? You know what people tweeted? Just guess. Well, it's too late in the day anyway, I'll show you. They tweeted something like this. They should have never used waterfall, right? Because waterfall doesn't work. And there was another guy tweeting, does the name of the project coincidentally start with a C? I don't know. So if you have projects starting with a C, you're doomed. <laughs> so basically the idea is, if you do waterfall, your projects will fail because waterfall doesn't work. It's the methodology that doesn't work, right? And then I tweeted this a few weeks later. I said, I heard about a Scrum project that spent several million euros and didn't deliver anything. What do you think people now tweeted? Not the same, they tweeted something totally different. People were saying they didn't apply Scrum right. Or they did Scrum but, whatever that might be. And <clears throat> the thing is, there is a big difference in what people think about this. So if you do a waterfall project and it fails, hey, that's natural, because waterfall doesn't work. But if you do a Scrum project, and I don't have anything against Scrum, but if you do a Scrum project and it fails, you're not doing the approach right. That's different. And it is not, because it will never be the approach that makes your project work. 
That symbiotic manifesto it says individuals and interactions over processes and tools, right? So let's see. So just to put it straight, I'm all against waterfall. I'm all for Scrum, but Scrum can be too lightweight for your project. Not a lot of people realize that by now, but it is. But I'm for Scrum, but well, not for Scrum, but but. <laughs> nah. <laughs> So your Scrum projects will fail too. They will actually do. And I'll show you why. First of all, we have to get to this one. You know what this is? It's Japanese, of course, and it's not Russian or Ukrainian or whatever. You know what this model is? It's Shuhari, right. Right from the start. And it says something like this. These are three levels of learning stuff. And it doesn't only go for agile, it goes for programming or riding a bicycle or doing a a Japanese fighting sport or whatever you do. So first of all, you start with learning the basics, right? Just copy the basics from somebody who's already done that. Not a scrum master, but somebody who's actually done it, right? And um, you learn that and you just copy it until it's natural. And a good example of this is the movie The Karate Kid. The old one, not the one with the son of Will Smith in, but the old one. There's this young guy who wants to learn karate. He goes to this very old Japanese guy, Mr. Miyagi, and he says, learn me karate. And this guy says, go off and wash my car. Have you seen the movie? But it's before your time, I guess. And he has to do, he has to wash the car, make this move like all the time. Well, with two sponges and then uh, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. Until it's in his system, it's automatic. So it's a defense mechanism and it's automatic and that's the shoe level, right? So you get to the next level and you try to break with stuff. You see, you're gonna reflect on what you do. That's what a lot of people don't do yet in the Agile community. So you just do this, and it seems to work. But you can reflect on that if you got the basics right and you start learning stuff and you're in projects and you see what happens, etc., etc. And in the end, you do transcendence, right? Japanese and whatever. You, you say, you know what? We can do everything we can because we are in project. And projects are unique. Every project is unique. So every project will have a unique approach. It's not just, what's in the Scrum Guide is good and everything else fails. No, there's a lot of more stuff to it. And there's also stuff that was invented, probably before you were born, but in, in any case, before Scrum was there. So there's a lot of good stuff in projects, even though they might have failed uh, as a majority, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of the projects we did in the 40 years before we were in Agile, right? And you shouldn't throw that away just because somebody tells you to. Right? You should be able to combine that. And that's the third level. So, here we are in Agile, and everybody's doing Agile, and there's a huge demand for Agile. Or Scrum, or Kanban, or XP, or whatever. <clears throat> and the thing is, we cannot meet the demand for that. There's not enough Agile coaches around in the world to coach all the Agile projects. So what happens is, people become a Scrum master. Who of you is a Scrum master? Oh, that's okay, there's a few. So how many days of training did that take? Two. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that you would try to learn scuba diving, right? Interesting concept. So you go off scuba diving. You go to somebody who has a, I don't know, a degree or diplomas or certificates in scuba diving. And so teach me how to scuba dive. And he says, okay, so if you do all this preparation, you go underwater. And when you come back and, uh, and you say to this guy, hey, how do you know? He said, well, I have to have two days of training doing a scuba diver, uh, masters, whatever. So that's the same as current masters. There's a lot of people out there, actually in my current project, um, I have three certified scrum masters. They have never been in an agile project before. <laughs> and this is what is happening in the marketplace right now. So this is a quote from an email within Capgemini, and, and I sort of anonymized it. And it says, Jack states that we have over 300 resources. There was a, a huge client demand from a bank. We have over 300 resources who are trained as a Scrum Master. 300? We don't even have 300 projects in their knowledge. So they don't have the experience. They have the training, they have the certificates but they don't have the experience, they like it. And by the way, there's a few things wrong with this quote. First of all, he talks about resources. I think he meant people. <laughs> and second of all, if you see this, people don't have a clue what they're talking about because Scrum is not an acronym. It's a word, but a capital, but it's not an acronym. So people writing Scrum as, a, as an acronym, they don't know what they're talking about. Or you also see, we're doing our project following the agile approach. It doesn't exist. 
or even worse, the Agile slash Scrum approach, which also doesn't exist, right? So there's too many people being pushed into projects, like you're the expert, go and tell us what to do. And they think, yeah, we have two days of training, what should we do? Well, I know how to rip off posters from left to right, because I've learned that, but other than that, hey, I don't know. So this is what happens. <laughs> so here's the certified Scrum Master, and he has to know it all. And there's no way that with two days of training you can know it all. You should get experience. We should actually sort of like bootstrap ourselves in this community, right? We have to learn. And the result of being a scrum man without any experience is what you see is that people at the shoe level, they will try to apply Agile in a really dogmatic way. So you're familiar with the word dogma, I know. <coughs> and well, I'll see, show you what Wikipedia says about this. Dogma is the established believer doctrine held by a religion, the Scrum Alliance, um, <laughs> or a particular group or organization, the Scrum.org guys. It's authoritative and not to be disputed, doubted, or diverged from. So you have to do exactly as it's said. By the practitioners or believers, and believe me, there's a lot of Scrum believers. <laughs> this is what will happen. And what these guys will do they will actually perform it like this. <laughs> right? We are the only true belief. And if you don't believe us, we'll cut your head off. This is actually, I'll show you some examples of this. For instance, stand-up meetings. I love stand-up meetings. They're great. I always take pictures of our stand-up meetings. and It's always fun to be in stand-up meetings. I've been doing that for quite a while. And uh, if you have a starting agile team, there's a lot of this going on, like there's the stand-up meeting, there's the project manager or the scrum master, and people will talk to him or her instead of to each other. And I had this with a starting team, and it's usually the case when teams start with Agile, they do this like this, right? You've seen that probably. And um, in came a scrum, the mentalist coach, and he was doing sort of an audit on the project, and he said, that's wrong! You're not allowed to do it like that, it should be like this. I said, yeah, I know it should be like that, but starting teams just don't do that. Right? And he says, well, if you don't, or if you're unable to do that, you should pass around something, uh, like a baton or a handkerchief or whatever. And I said, this is not a kid's game. We're doing software development. Go away. <laughs> so here's a good stand-up meeting, and here's a wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> what happened here is that this is a really inexperienced project manager, and you can see the difference. This one has a tie, and this one doesn't. <laughs> but these were all very experienced developers, and they, you know, they just sat down at their desk, and they, did, they didn't stand up or anything. They started reading their email during the stand-up meetings. And so we got them out here and said, you know, we're going to do stand-up meetings in the hallway where the coffee machine is, and we put a, a table there, and they said, well, it improved. But this was clearly not the good idea, right? So and here's another thing. If you do a dashboard or a task board, or whatever you might call it, or a Kanban board or whatever, this is what typically appears in Scrum projects. You have things that you still have to do, things you're working on, and there's stuff that's done, right? So this is the typical Scrum task board. In my particular projects, I have work items that go through a number of more stages than that. So we have stuff that's in iteration, stuff that we're working on, like development, development testing, testing acceptance, testing, rework acceptance, and approval. That's the way it's in my project. This is an agile project that's been running for two and a half years, and it will still run for another year. So we've been there, you know, and in comes this agile uh, scrum coach, he says, no, you're not allowed to do it, Lash, you should do it like this. And I again said, go away. <laughs> <laughs> this works for my project, it works fine, so shut up. <laughs> and it's allowed to say shut up to scrum masters, you know. <laughs> or this thing, this is called a user story. Well, you've all written them, right? It's sort of like the standard requirements technique in an agile project. And as a requirements technique, this basically sucks. Because I'll show you, I'll show you a bit later on, I'll show you the landscape of uh, one of my clients, and it's just too complex. This doesn't work. We do modeling in our agile projects. And then there, there's a guy who says, no, you're not allowed to do modeling in agile projects. And again, I said, <laughs> right. So, and then there's all these agile conferences, and this one is a pretty concrete one. I like that. But there's a lot of these fluffy agile conferences out there that, that do fluffy stuff, like just write down small things on small papers. It's your Kaizen. What is this? I'm a freaking coder. I don't write on small papers. I write code, right? 
So this is what I do. I, I, I hate that, all that fluffy stuff in Agile. I've, I've written a couple of very angry blog posts. You should read them on my blog. Angry blog posts about this stuff and that we should get rid of all this fluffiness in Agile anyway. So here's us. And we're also guilty of Agile projects failing because we're all bug builders. As a developer, you can do anything, right? We're able to write anything, create any source code that we want, anything. So I'll give you an interesting example of this one. It, this was the very first .NET project in the Netherlands. And I was in that, and a lot of experienced developers were in that too. Well, they didn't have the .NET experience yet, because it was just released a week before we started. And um, there's this client, he says, you know what, <clears throat> I want to have a grid of all the regions in the Netherlands, with the, the, how many people are insured in that region. And Okay, just a grid. Uh, if you do .NET, you know, that's pretty easy. In an ASP .NET web application, put a grid up, takes you half an hour to build, done. Right? And this really experienced developer, he's now a regional director for Microsoft, he said, you know what we also could do? We could create a pie chart. Cool, and then we could drill down on it, and you could see the regions and the cities and whatever, and it would be much better. And the project manager, I, I watched him, and he, he goes, he had a tie, and he went like, <laughs> <laughs> So the developer started working on that, and then back in that time, you couldn't do pie charts in .NET. You could create objects that you could map on a JPEG, and I put the JPEG up on the website, and uh, we had to make clickable errors, or he did, so he, he decided to split up every of these parts of the pie into little triangles using sinuses, cosinuses, tangents, and stuff like that, really difficult calculation, which I hadn't done since high school, but he succeeded, and you could click on it and drill down, and it took him six days and six nights. <laughs> Instead of the half hour that the client was asking for. That's a bit overdone. But this is what we do. You know, we offer too much to our client. Stuff that he actually didn't ask for. And that's what I call the bug the builder syndrome, right? So, let's move on a bit. So basically, my message is for today, there's no such thing as the agile approach that will fit, that will fit all your projects. It doesn't exist. Projects are too different from each other. Some of them are really small, you can build a mobile web app in a few weeks, or you can do a very complex uh, uh, finance system in three years, and it can still be an agile project. But these have really different characteristics. They're not the same, right? So why do they differ? Well, first of all, in teams. This was a team. I think this one was taken from the World Championships again, but <laughs> teams differ, you know. And if you look at what agile approaches say about teams, well, there's not always the same feeling. You know, if you look at the basic picture of XP, XP, I love XP because there's so many good practices in it, but as a, as a, as a process, it's really, really lightweight. There's only three roles defining it. Like there's the client, and there's a coach, there's a developer. There's no analysts, there's no testers, there's no end users, this is it. So basically you have to figure it out how to do that if you're in a more complex project. And if you look into what Scrum says about it, Scrum says, well, there's the product owner, so like the client representative, and here's the scrum master again, uh, the, the guy with the certification, and here's the team, and the team does the work. So who's in the team? Well, that differs from project to project. Some projects, you only have developers, right? But in most projects, I find it very good practice to have at least one or two testers in my team, because they look at the world differently. Does anybody feel a real tester? I'm not a coder, but okay, cool. Um, testers usually look at uh, the exceptions, the alternatives, and stuff like that. And we as developers, we just go, Wah. that's it, <laughs> done. Right? So, what, what is sad about a team in Scrum is this. The team is responsible for delivering the, pro the product. A team is typically made of five to nine people. Well, I have 15 in my project, so I'm not a Scrum project. I suppose not. Um, with cross-functional skills, who do the actual work, like analysis, design, development, testing, technical documentation, uh, technical communication, document. Etc. I do this part usually. And, um, <laughs> so this is so anybody you need to build this product is in the team. So that's what we do. But it's not defined who is in the team. And there's other agile approaches like this one's called Smart. Uh, my team and I wrote this in 1998, I think, and it, it has some more roles. Just as an example, we have like customer user, the main expert, manager. Yes, we have project managers in our teams. Coaches, developers, testers, etc., etc. And if you look at DSDM, for instance, DSDM has even more roles. 
It doesn't say that you need, you need all of these roles per se, but at least look at what the other roles can mean for your project. So there's differences in teams, right? There's all kinds of sorts of teams. I like this one. Every time I see, every time I see this picture, I get this melody in my head. Basically. So what is the key factor to being successful as a team? There's only one thing to it. It's collaboration. It's people working together. Working together from different roles. You know, these are three different kinds of developers. And he's a, well, he's a sort of like an analyst. He should be an analyst, analyst anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in a large company, in a large organization, you might wonder what happens to your roles. Because most of these organizations are still organized in a wonderful way. You have a department for analysts, a department for functional designers, a department for developers, a department for testers, and even a department for project managers and for enterprise architects, people like that, you know. So what happens to them? Well, if you're not careful about mixing all these in your real team, something like this will come out. I, I created this slide this morning. I thought it was a nice metaphor. I call this a, a rowing context collaboration. What you see in larger organizations is that there's a separate team of enterprise architects. They're usually on a different floor than the developers are. Then there's the end users, and then there's the development team, and a test team, and maybe even an offshore development team. And they, although the testers may work as a team, a test team, this is not an optimal way to do collaboration. You should have boats that have one purple guy in it, and one of these, and one of these, and one of these, and one of these, one of these in one team, right? Building a feature or something that looks like a feature. Not separate teams. And as you can see, the offshore development team is lagging behind a lot from the end or something. Anyway, so. <clears throat> so here's a typical team. This was a team of one of my projects. We had a product owner, huh? two business analysts. I didn't even know what these guys were doing. They invent their own diagramming techniques. <laughs> Usually in PowerPoint, by the way. And then as an information analyst or functional analyst, there's an SAP CRM consultant. He was actually the most expensive guy in the team. Um, we had two SAP XI developers. That's SAP middleware. Don't, get, don't, don't try to do this. Um, there's an SAP ABAP developer, which is a horrible programming language. Um, in the top of programming languages, it's just below Visual Basic. Of, of ugly programming languages it is. There was a UI developer, a .NET developer, a Java developer, a two testers, a Scrum master, and me. So would you consider this a typical Agile team or a Scrum project? This is a Scrum project, you know. So teams are totally different than just put a bunch of developers in a room and they'll find out what happens. There's more to it. And another big question in Agile project is, where does the backlog come from? People usually come up to me and say, it's the product owner who delivers the backlog, right? So when does that happen? It should be part of your project, I think, but it isn't. If you look at Scrum, it's just there. <laughs> it's not like anybody invests in creating the backlog. You, know, you should have that already when the project starts. It doesn't make sense because when a project starts, you should have a plan, right? And in the plan should be an estimate of the total size of your project, more or less, given the scope what you have. And the scope might change, but it, it's pretty good to have an estimate and a plan to do your project in, right? So if you look at Agile approaches, there's no such thing in XP that says how to get to the, the, the actual stack of uh, um, of, of index cards that they have user stories on them. It, it doesn't tell. And the same goes for Scrum. Scrum either doesn't tell you how to get to the backlog. It's just there. And you start a first sprint, and um, you create the sprint backlog, uh, derived from the product backlog, and you start working, right? Being a C-sharp developer, by the way, I think it's strange that it's called sprint one. It should be called sprint zero, right? We don't start counting that one. That's for Visual Basic guys. And, um, so, but, and then there's people saying, well, there is actually a sprint zero in Scrum. It isn't. There is no such thing as a sprint zero in Scrum, where you define your bad walk, create a plan, stuff like that. But there's other agile approaches, like the SDM again, that have something called feasibility study and business study. Those are also iterations, but they don't deliver uh, software as much. Well, they could deliver some software just to test it out. But there's other stuff you can do there, like create a plan, right? 
Um, I was doing an, an audit on a project in Belgium, which is another very small country on the other side of Europe, and um, it actually failed miserably. I usually get into projects when they fail, um, so next week I have to go to Germany. <laughs> Uh, there's no relation between failing projects in Germany, by the way, but um, they have some projects failed in the past uh, 100 years. Like, um, so, uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, that's a dangerous joke. Any Germans in the room? <laughs> I should have asked that beforehand, I guess. But <laughs> Anyway, this project in Belgium, um, I talked to the project manager and said, so why is this project failing? He said, you know what, when we started this project, we had a Scrum Master who said, no, you do not do a project plan in a Scrum project. So they didn't have a plan, right? This is a two-year project. And the next thing they didn't have was acceptance criteria for the project. So they got into a debate with the client, and the client didn't want to accept the software that they built. And he was rightfully, uh, uh, he was in his right because there were no acceptance criteria. So they couldn't agree on that the software was done. In this particular case, it was a nuclear agency, so I think acceptance criteria might have been good to have, right? <laughs> and they didn't have it, so they couldn't get the software out. And it's such a normal thing to do. But a lot of these Scrum projects just don't do that. So again, there's, uh, I'll put a picture up of FDD, which is another agile approach, and it has also some preliminary stuff in there, like develop an overall model, build the feature list, and create a plan, stuff like that. And again, in SMART, um, it's the same. We have two preliminary iterations, they, sometimes they're composed to one, um, that has as end goal, write the project plan. What we do actually, when we start a project, it starts earlier than uh, an average scrum project. It starts here, with a backlog that has items in there like create a plan, do an estimate, create a model like FTD does, um, look at uh, what the goals are, your stakeholders, stuff like that. Things you need to find out. Set up your development environment, set up your test environment, stuff like that. It's stuff that you can do to have a really good start creating software. So there's something like preliminary iterations. And it's good to have them. But then say you actually always need them, but, but they're good. So this is an interesting picture, by the way. I took this one from a project that I was uh, um, sort of like starting it up and then I left the project. And they had 15 of these maps, 15, of these maps with documentation. It was a wonderful project. And uh, I thought the project manager don't do it wonderful, but he did anyway, project failed, etc. etc. Et so I took one of these maps out and um, uh, I carried it around for about a year to show it at talks that, you know, this is not the type of documentation you should write. And at one point in time, later on, I was cleaning my room in the office and in one of the drawers I found this map and I had totally forgotten about it, right? So when I went back to the team, they were still programming. And I said, you know what, I had this map in my drawer for about a year, and I'm here to give it back to you. I said, okay. <laughs> they didn't miss it. <laughs> so this is about over-documentation, right? But there's also something like under-documentation. And if you just do, um, like these really simple user stories, it might just not be enough. So if this is your landscape, and this was the landscape of one of the projects I was in, this is actually every square in this particular picture is a system. It's not a class, it's a system. So they have over 40 systems collaborating to do all the work. And this is just the landscape of their customer service department. It's a really large company in the Netherlands. For, I'll give you an example. This particular pink one is called SAP CRM. It has a database, an Oracle database. You know how many tables reside in this particular database underneath this system? How many? Hundreds? That's quite a lot, isn't it? Hundreds, right? It's more. Much more. <laughs> Do another guess. One thousand. One thousand. That's, that's pretty much, isn't it? It would amaze you if the database would have a thousand tables. It's more. <laughs> it's a lot more, I can tell you. There were 142,000 tables in this particular database. So that gives you an idea about the size of this landscape. It's huge. If they put up, if you have a renew your subscription, you have to upload a picture, and that picture goes through 12 different systems before it's finally the process is done, right? They implement business processes through this landscape. And if you just would do, hey, you know what, as a librarian, I want to be able to send it. <laughs> it's simply not enough, you know. And, and then always these, these fundamentals people come up to me and say, you know what, um, user stories are merely meant to get, to get the conversation going. You've heard this one, I guess. Right? And it's a good way to get the conversation going in an agile project. Write it down and talk about it and see what happens. But the thing is, 
You cannot stop by just saying it's a means to get the conversation going because this conversation has to be, and I know it's an ugly word, documented. There is no such thing as we don't do documentation in Agile projects. Um, if you look at the Agile Manifesto, and actually it's the same message that Simon had yesterday, um, um, there's work in software over comprehensive documentation. It doesn't say don't write documentation. It says write just enough documentation. And how much that is differs from project to project. If you're in this really particular complex landscape, you need more documentation. Why? Well, simply because it has to be maintained, the software you build. It's not just your project. The, the, the actual product that you build has a much longer life cycle than just coming out of the project and it's done, go out there and use it, etc., etc. It gets releases, right? People want changes to it. Uh, there's bugs in it, whatever. So it has a much longer life cycle. Usually software lasts for about 15 years. Actually, one of my current, the current project is building the, the web application on top of COBOL. The COBOL application that they now use with a character-based interface, which is still used daily by, I think, about around a thousand users, is over 30 years old. And they still maintain it. And if you wouldn't have documentation to do that, you would be screwed. And that's where a lot of these projects get screwed. You need documentation, but do it just enough. And that's different from project to project, as I said. And then there's estimation. <laughs> you know about estimation. You won't do that, right? How do you estimate? In points, right? That's one of the powerful things that comes out of the edge of the community. We estimate in points, not in hours. Hours sucks because my hours are not your hours. You can be twice as fast as I am. And if I do the estimating, you have to do the work. It doesn't fit, etc., etc. But you have to be aware about estimating in points. It's good. You know, it's just like Scrum, it's good, but you have to look at it really, really careful. But, for instance, if you're in this small project, I took these pictures in the company restaurant of my company, and uh, I had to arrange these, these pedestals uh, uh, every now and then to take the pictures, and they didn't like that, so they kept me out. Of, uh, not, but not out of the company, but out of the restaurant. So, here's one team in a project, that's it, and they do estimate. And they estimate in, like, well, apples, right? So two apple points, four apple points, five apple points, whatever kind of points. But you estimate as a team, in an agile project, the guys or girls who do the work, they do the estimate. That's how it works, basically. So if you're in a team, you estimate together, and out comes one figure for each of your work items. That's good, that's a good technique. But if you go on to having two teams in your project, you might think that the situation is the same in both the teams. And if they work separate from each other and do their own estimates, which is usually the case in the Scrum project and in most agile projects, um, even though they might use the same skill, they might not do the same estimates. Because for them, something that is a four might be much simpler than what is a four for them. That can actually happen, right? Apples aren't apples anymore. It's because teams estimate independently. And a project manager of this team, of, the, of this project, might think, come to the conclusion, like, you know what, you're both doing a four, and it takes them 10 hours, and it takes you 20 hours. So what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> and it could be that way off. I know, it could happen, but it could also happen that um, they just <coughs> estimate differently using the same scale. And it happened to me in projects. So it's actually like, this is more likely to happen. And it gets worse because if one of more of your teams are on the other side of the world, <laughs> like here or in India or Romania or wherever they are, there's no way that you can actually agree on that they estimate on the same scale with the same levels of complexity. So estimation is still hard, right? I only got five minutes. I'll try to speed up a bit. This was a slow talk so far, so I can speed up. <laughs> So then there's this thing. I love burn downs and burn ups as well. Um, and just one warning, if you see this particular picture in a presentation, you have to distrust the guy who's giving the presentation. Because this one is the very first you will see if you Google for burn down chart. So if they only have this example, they're not doing agile, I think. So uh, I'll show you another one. This is from my current project. Actually, it's the one from a year ago because we're now in iteration 63. And the thing is about these burn down charts, I love them, you know, it gives you a great idea of how to extrapolate the stuff and see when your project is done. But usually, they extrapolate to, uh, it's a burn down, so they go down. But the thing is, 
This particular line is straight, right? And uh, if it burned down, you, you're probably going to say, you know what, this is, if I go to back to zero, it sort of like inclines that the scope will remain the same during the project, and it doesn't. So we're using uh, much more burn up charts, which is sort of like the same principle. So this is our burn down, we combine them. This is our burn down, and this is our burn up, which is basically the number of points that you have finished. So what's so different about it? Well, not much. Actually, this is halfway the project, of course. It's this particular blue line that's so interesting. This is the scope line. This is the total number of points that we had in the project. And it isn't straight. It wiggles a bit, right? And now we're actually, if you look at the, I couldn't find the, uh, the, the iteration 63 evaluation report. And it, it's a bit going down, and we're nearly there. It's only like we're this close from finishing the must-haves of the project. So a burn-up chart, to me, makes a bit more sense than a burn down because it, it's, it's configured to the scope of your project. And that, to me, is, is a little bit better. So what you actually should do, if you're in an Agile project, I'm nearly the end of the talk, is you should look at Agile as a sliding scale. It's not a straight line. Not all projects will fit your basic approach. So there's different Agile approaches. And as you can see, it's like Alistair Coburn calls uh, adding a bit of ceremony to it, right? <coughs> if your project is more complex, then you probably need a little bit more structure in your team than you would have in a really short project doing three iterations and build some small mobile application, right? So that's, it's a sliding scale and it adds ceremony, like a bit more roles and how they work together, maybe a bit more documentation, maybe structure a bit. So you can go all the way up and probably you would end up something using rational unified process if you're here. Don't do that, by the way, but anyway, you could, you could uh, try to do that. And, uh, and all the agile approaches are somewhere along the line. So what you should actually do is configure the Agile approach for your project. I'll show you some code, right? Oh, static dynamic, right? I got this from another presentation. Oh, no, I call this static Agile, right? Here's the static part. You know, I have this interface called I approach. It's good to have some code at the end of the day. It is. It's actually C sharp, so it's real code. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to joke about Java now. <laughs> I probably won't make it to the hotel if I do. Anyway, so here's a list of teams, right? They implement our team. Here's a dashboard, and here's a unit of work. And I built an abstract class to do that, and you know what, in a Scrum project, I really do it fast because you all can read the code. Like typical Scrum projects, you do this. You know, there's a list of teams and they're local. Um, I have something called a task board, that's mandatory, it only has to do working and done. And the unit of work, eh, let's see, this is story, done. This is the configuration of a static Scrum project. To me, that's not right because it doesn't fit my particular project. So what I do, I usually make it a bit more dynamic. Like I plug in different stuff. You could use dependency injection for that one. That won't make the code go down readable here. So I just this is a simple way of doing it. Um, you know what? I, I'm taking a bit of a more structured approach. I could do smart or FTD or whatever. So I plug that in. And I don't use a typical task board because I'm using a Kanban board because I want to improve my process. And I have two local teams and a team in the Ukraine. Um, I have to change this one every now and then, of course, but I, I, I only do talks here in the Ukraine and in the Netherlands anyway, so that's... And uh, as the unit work, I'm not going to use user stories, I'm going to use features for, for, for whatever reason. So you sort of like um, assemble your Agile approach for the project you do, because your project is unique. And um, there's one, one other reminder I have to make. I see a lot of organizations in the Netherlands who have been working with Agile for a longer time. And it's what these big organizations do. They try to institutionalize stuff, right? They are going to write the handbook Agile. And that's where things will actually get worse because what happens is they're going to write stuff down like um, if you put a user story on a, on a post-it, it should be a pink post-it. And if it's a task, it should be a yellow post-it. And if it's a stage, it should be a green post-it. They will actually start writing stuff like that down. And th the moment that happens, you're doomed. The organization will kill Agile within the year, I think. So Agile is about being flexible, being able to cope with different situations in different projects. That's what we do, because you want to create different stuff. Maybe you want your elastic band to get this product, or maybe this product. I want to have one of these, actually. That looks cool. <laughs> and, um, or maybe even automated further, like in a software factory or whatever. So actually, by the way, it's not forbidden to create a standardized software factory in Agile. People will tell you it's against Agile. It's not. It's just professionalizing stuff we do in larger companies. It will happen. So we're done. In retrospective, um, basically, 
Software projects fail. <laughs> <laughs> So last Monday, uh, when I was in Kharkiv, and uh, I was at the airport checking in, and uh, uh, they definitely run Windows 95, <laughs> which is a failure anyway, right? So, um, just to be sure, there is no such thing, Agile is not a religion, right? So don't hook up with any of these scrum domains like Kanbanet, or whatever you call it. Uh, um, don't be as ill about this, because there's good stuff in all of these Agile approaches, right? It's a sliding skill, and depending on your project, your Agile approach will actually differ. So, um, you should assemble Agile, that's my conclusion for today. And, um, and there's actually value in all of these Agile approaches. And also, yes, there's also value in the wonderful projects we've done before. There's very good requirements technique in there maybe. Or maybe they have very good construction techniques or whatever you do. And, um, and, and, and about Agile communities, can we please stop with all this fluffiness in, in Agile? Just go out, code stuff, test stuff. But not the fluffy stuff anymore. And then you can be really successful, like a real team with different roles working together. So, that's my conclusion for today. Um, maybe there are more questions. You're free to ask them anyway. By the way, this is at a Microsoft event, if you can imagine. Um, I also have to slide for vice versa too for Java events, but um, <laughs> here's my Twitter account. Thank you very much for uh, getting me through the end of this, uh, actually through the end of the, uh, of the conference. And uh, well, we hope to see you all next time.